came from a place called Mullingar in the Midlands of Ireland, and I never left that place. It was like, that's all I knew till the age of 13. So my dad, who was in the Irish army, uh, was stationed in Israel with the United Nations for two years. So he decided to bring us with him. And there was complete peace in the Middle East. I mean, unusually complete peace for up to 14 or 15 years at that stage until the day the Breslins landed in Tel Aviv. I mean, the day we landed and the nine day war started, which is now what is referred to, which was a war between the Hezbollah and the IDF. And my dad drove us straight up to the border into the middle of us because he was too tight to actually get another uh, apartment somewhere a little safer. So off he went up to the border and I was there about two days. And in the middle of the night, a woman with a loudspeaker came through the town we were staying in Naharia to tell us to get into our bomb shelters. I'd never heard the word bomb shelter. I didn't know what it was. And my dad came to the front of my room and he said, Niall, I know you're scared. Uh, I know you're really terrified here, but we're okay. We're safe here, he said. And he said something till the day I die, I'll never forget. He said, go back to sleep, son. I was like, what? Go back to sleep. This isn't a bad dream that there's, a, there's like bombs, shells dropping a couple of miles up the road. And that's the night the switch went on in my life. And it's never gone off. And I came home from Israel and I was a different child. I was a completely removed child. And I was a very social child. I loved kind of being out and about. And something happened, something clicked inside me. And my mum had a book that most Irish mothers had in the 90s, uh, not the Bible, but the Encyclopedia of Health. And I had every disease known to man and woman in that book. And on a Monday, I'd look at the book and I'd have appendicitis. Tuesday, I would have cancer. Wednesday, I would be pregnant. I literally talk myself into every disease in that book. That's how good anxiety is. It can turn the most irrational stuff into a rational thought. And this is probably one of the most important points I make is we have a stereotype around mental health around the world that only certain types of people can be affected by mental health difficulties. And it's an immensely dangerous stigma because what that does is people who are struggling, they, they then feel that they don't justify getting help. And that is something we got to change very fast. The reason I'm saying that is I was a captain in my school football team. I was playing provincial rugby for Leinster. I was in a band. I have amazing parents. I have unbelievable sisters sometimes. I have a lovely brother. I had a quintessential middle-class country upbringing, army officer, father, music teacher, mother. Didn't fit into the equation we like to make around mental health. And actually that drove me deeper and deeper within myself because I knew I shouldn't be like this. And I got to 18 and I went to University College Dublin where I had a rugby scholarship to study economics and finance. I can't even spell that anymore. <laughs> and my first day in UCD, about 600 people came out of a lecture theater in one go. And like, I didn't even realize that much makeup existed. It was like Brown Thomas exploding or, you know, Har Harrods exploding in front of me. And I went straight down the middle of everybody down to, if you can picture them, the, the rugby jock, six foot six, 18 and a half stone, running down to the toilet and stayed there for six hours and had a panic attack and dropped out of college because I couldn't function. I literally couldn't function. And I did what most people do and what culture tells us to do when, you know, something like this happens, when, when we're hit by a wall, culture tells us to set goals. Just be better version to yourself. And we're running around ragged, trying to set goals all the time, believing that that is where our happiness lies. And I'm here to make the argument that, that is not where your happiness lies. And goals are really important to give you, you know, purpose and North Star. They're really important. The problem is we've created a modern culture that only values them. And at that point in my life, at 21 years of age, I decided that the only way I could get better is through setting a goal. So I made the goal to be the, the Irish under 21s rugby team and captain for the World Cup in Sydney. And I did. And I went down to Sydney. And all that went through my head is, who are they going to put me in a room with? Who are they going to put me in a room with? Because I couldn't hide this. You know, I couldn't hide this in a room at three or four in the morning. And right enough, I had a panic attack first night. And I ended up sleeping in the balcony for five weeks in Sydney and telling my roommate that the room was too hot. And here's the thing. My roommate, who went on to win senior medals with Ireland, Six Nations, uh, you know, championships, Tiny Cup medals, rang me three years ago to say in Sydney, he was going through the same thing. If we're going to change anything on mental health, we can have all the theory we want, we can have all the kind of social narrative around it. It's peer-to-peer -peer social support. It's one of the most effective forms of therapy. The research tells us that, the psychology tells us that. 
the ability to turn to peers and colleagues and friends and not to be judged. If you can get there, if you can get there, everything else starts to open up. It is such a crucial part of this conversation. Imagine how different that five weeks would have been if I knew he was going through that and he knew what I was going through when he was walking around Sydney at four in the morning and I just thought he was nervous and I was sleeping in the bluey balcony. And I came back from Australia and I was the only player in that squad who was offered a full-time professional contract with Leinster. And the media like to tell you this is a weakness. I hadn't slept in five weeks. I was barely eating and I was still getting professional contracts because I... Believe it or not, the toughest people on earth are people who struggle with their minds. They have to be. They're the most resilient. And I shouldn't have signed that contract because I was really unwell. And at this point was my, the beginning of my journey with my clinical depression, which ultimately led me on a, a pretty serious journey with my mental health. And clinical depression, it's very important. We can't have a conversation around this. is isn't a bad day. The only way I can describe what it felt like to me was a constant quest for feeling, to feel anything bad or good it's just something after three years at Leinster I I just couldn't do it anymore I just broke I couldn't do it and I went up to my coach and said I'm retiring and he said you have a year left in your contract and he says why are you retiring and I told him I hated rugby it, I, I, I felt that was a safer thing to say than I'm in absolute agony and I haven't been able to function for three years and I still couldn't say that even though I was leaving and my biggest regret with that was the two players I played with since then died of suicide and I feel I could have been the person that didn't save them. I don't feel guilty about it. I just feel regret that I didn't say something. I didn't start the conversation because I knew I wasn't on my own and I still am. not So two weeks after this breakdown and I suppose really huge help from the NHS, I got offered a new job as a coach on the TV show, The Voice. <laughs> I, I told you the story was eclectic and I shouldn't have signed that contract. I really shouldn't, but it's TV. I was like, I was skint. I wasn't able to work. They were flying me home every day, every, every week. So I did it. And all that went through my head is you're going to have a panic attack on live television. I told myself I'd have that panic attack. And I did 10 minutes before a live TV show. I was on the floor in my dressing room, vomiting, shaking. You know the score, because I'm going to guess a few of you've had these. They're kind of common. They're horrible, but they're common. And I stood up after what felt like an hour and I look in the mirror and it's over now. This is how people are going to find out on primetime television and the biggest TV show in Ireland. I am going to be at my most vulnerable. And I changed my shirt. The thing I worried about most is my eyes were blood red. And I, I just, I don't, I don't know how anyone didn't notice. But I went out and I did that show, 90 minutes. Don't remember much of it. Walked off for the credits, barely said goodbye to anybody, got into a taxi back to my hotel, opened the door, fell in the door, sobbed, and there, you, there, ladies and gentlemen, is my rock bottom. And you have two options when you hit that. You stay there or you find a way out. And I'll happily say that the shift that came from that was pretty gargantuan to a point where I found myself in front of the, the entire EU parliament to talk about policy, to talk about models of psychology. And I think back to that point of the room, in the dressing room, shaking, to the point standing in front of 52 leaders of Europe and saying these things. So that's the journey I've gone on. It hasn't been pretty. It isn't pretty. But I took the scenic route. It's longer. It's got more hills, potholes, crap roads. But it's worth it. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so much. No really powerful. Thank you. Amazing.